Good afternoon. Thank you uh, for joining our session today. We're going to talk for the next 15 minutes about something a little different. We're going to talk less about VR and more about another medium that I think has preceded this new technology and we can learn from in ways we can use it for social good. I run an organization based in New York called Games for Change. We've been around for 14 years and have been the leading advocate for the use of this digital medium for social good, for the use in education, for the use in healthcare, for the use in raising awareness around social issues. And I believe there's a lot that can be learned about how we've built this sector um, around games and digital media into the world of uh, virtual reality and augmented reality and ways in which that medium can also be used for social good. So first I'm going to ask the question, why games? Why, oh, I will ask that question, why? Yeah, why games? Why are games even important uh, in this opportunity to, to reach people around social issues? Well, games, we look at it in a couple of ways. Games is an $80, $80 billion global industry. It has now become the mainstream, one of the mainstream forms of media and of entertainment, like the way that we are discussing whether virtual reality or augmented reality will ever come. Um, it has the ability to launch intellectual property in a, in a dynamic way that other forms of media can't. The game uh, Grand Theft Auto by Take-Two Interactive uh, reached one billion in sales in just three days. And when you look at the Hollywood industry, how long it takes for a gross to, to gross those kind of numbers in a blockbuster, it will take several weeks if not months. The average age of a gamer is, some, is, is reducing, no, uh, excuse me, is increasing. No longer are we talking about young kids in the basement playing video games. With the invention and the adoption of mobile, the, the mobile industry, we have casual gamers playing games all day long in the subways while they're waiting on the supermarket. Games who are, uh, gamers who are women. We've got almost 44% uh, of, of women worldwide are playing, are playing games. Then you look at the number of hours that people are playing games a week. Uh, games guru Jane McGonigal, who has a fantastic TED talk, talks about how many hours over 3 billion hours a week are being spent playing games. And our belief, if we can harness just some of this activity into a social good, what a great opportunity that would have. Another way to look at at the games industry is the way, the way in which it is now addressing social issues. We look at television and the, and the television show Sesame Street, which Go, Joan Gans Cooney created in the 1960s. And she believed that television as a format could educate young people and get them ready for kindergarten. Now we're looking at it 40 some odd years later and it's a global uh, program that are teaching young people all over the world um, how to get ready for kindergarten. Mainstream media in Hollywood are, are producing films that are winning Academy Awards like Hidden Figures before that games uh, shows like Argo. They're, they're making huge profits for Hollywood and they're also demonstrating or informing the public about an issue or a piece of information they may not be aware of. The documentary industry um, has also created uh, content that breaks through the mainstream, showing different ways to talk about subject matter. Um, a filmmaker named Morgan uh, Spurlock really broke a great story about the, the, um, the fast food market and about what the effects those have in the human body through a very comedic documentary film called Supersize Me, which if you haven't seen it, is worth seeing. And it's remarkable what, what that can do, that kind of food can do to your body. And the last thing I want to talk about is the form of comic books, which now have a whole category in, books, in booksellers called graphic novels. And you had a, an artist, a storyteller, Art Spiegelman, who for the first time was able to convey a story of significance of, uh, in historical context and put it out in art form through color, through images, through art, and, and be received in, in a public way. Another way to take a look about, ga about um, games is a type of medium. Here we talk about, we look at uh, someone watching television. It's a passive experience. You just have to lean back and absorb the information that's coming, coming in front of you. When you're looking at games, it is a, an interactive medium. 
where the players actually have agency in, in which to, to move the story forward, to step into the role of a character, trial and error, see how things work. Um, if you move that medium forward in virtual reality, you are now immersed in an environment and obviously have a different kind of relationship with the content that you are experiencing. And you think about putting a game format around that, how people can learn, how people can experience other, uh, be in the, in the, in the foot and the, the, the steps of another person in a way that they wouldn't in a traditional media experience. And finally, augmented reality. The ability to merge the real world and the physical world um, and in, in the d digital world. The game of Pokemon Go, if we're going to talk about the context of games and augmented reality, really opened up the door in ways a lot of uh, developers and storytellers can engage in bringing the real world into a game and bringing kids and bringing people outside the home to experience uh, a very popular right, form of entertainment. So, Games for Change, I'll talk just a few minutes about the organization and what we do. Um, we have been working on bringing together different communities who make games that have some kind of, po uh, some kind of positive impact. It, 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 it's a community of different kind of stakeholders in the process. There are, film, there are the, the commissioners and the government bodies who are, are funding these kind of pro these projects. Uh, they might be brands who are looking out to do it, part of our, our customer service, a corporate social responsibility. Um, there are also the talent, obviously the game developers, the designers, the artists, the sound engineers, the musicians who are coming together to make worthwhile and, and, and amazing experiences. And finally, in the space of impact, there are the people who are assessing the impact that these projects are happening and the content matter experts who are partnering with the creators so we can actually come up with content and experiences that can drive impact and we can actually measure and assess the impact that that experience is intended to have. So we um, at Games for Change, oh, here I'll talk a little bit about funding. So in the United States, at least, we have a number of different entities looking at funding. We have government agencies like NASA and DARPA, the Department of Education. Uh, we have universities who have uh, game programs and are doing a lot of experiments. Uh, a lot of foundations like the MacArthur Foundation, the Bill Gates Foundation, all funneling funds into ways that games and other digital media can have impact. And finally, brands are looking at realizing that games and other digital media are a great way to reach audiences. And you couple that with a uh, positive program or a campaign, uh, the brand can have a lot of impact. Um, and in the U.S. alone, there are close to 500 schools offering game design programs. It'll be interesting to see how that, how that number grows in the virtual reality space of the coming years. Um, so at Games for Change, we have been part of starting a movement. We have been building this community together and doing that across um, a number of programs. We hold festivals. We, have, we act as a uh, convener of the different stakeholders in, the, in this space. We consult with other non-for-profits or foundations or businesses that want to get involved in the games or interactive uh, industries but don't necessarily know how to, to start. And then we work in schools and we are look to educate the next generation of content makers and, and, see, and helping them see the value of creating content that can have a social purpose. Um, our flagship event is the Games for Change Festival, which we've run for the last 14 years in New York City. Um, this year, for the first time, we um, are launching, um, let me go forward. Yep. Okay, our program is over a five-day period, and for the first time, we have a lot of uh, virtual reality focus. You'll see on the schedule here, we actually are having our first uh, game jam, uh, which is like a hackathon, but with game developers, but focused on virtual reality and neuroscience. So we're bringing together 30, uh, 30 neuroscientists and 30 dev teams to come together, explore over a two and a, hundred, two and a half day period how uh, games and virtual reality and neuroscience can complement and support each other. If anyone in the audience is interested, let me know because we are now recruiting different uh, participants. At the main festival, we've broken out the, the program across three tracks. Uh, the games and social impact community is mature enough now that we're able to focus our conversations into three areas, health and neuroscience, 
games for education and in the classroom, and then civic and social issues. And then on the last day, we are going to focus on building this community now about VR and change and impact. Um, so, so VR for Change is uh, an a, a initiative that we're launching that will hopefully help develop the same type of community that we've been able to, to help develop in the game sector, looking to bring together the, video, the VR and AR and MR creators, the government agencies and not-for-profits that are, that are looking to use this medium for impact, assessment experts and psychologists who can actually, who are informing how these, game, these interactive experiences are being created, but also how they're being measured and how can you demonstrate that the impact is actually happening. I'm gonna talk just for a few minutes about how we look at different types of impact in the game sector when you think talking about social good. And I encourage you to think about how this approach might be applied to developing virtual reality experiences. We talk about, we talk about um, breaking down the type of impact into six different categories. The first is education. How can this game or virtual experience transfer knowledge? Now, there are a lot of uh, activity going on in the US about how games are now used in the classroom. In fact, uh, our former uh, Supreme Court justice um, uh, named Sandra Day O'Connor started a game studio uh, seven years ago where she wanted to treat, teach civic education to middle school age children. And, and now, through the, ga through the nonprofit game studio called iCivics, there are games being distributed over 70% uh, of schools in the United States. Another way to think about impact besides transfer of knowledge is are you just trying to raise awareness around an issue? Are you trying to develop empathy for, um, uh, for uh, people that you might not have access to? Or is there an issue that you want to make sure people act on and maybe do something in the real world? Um, Dumb Ways to Die, I think, is a great example how um, an issue, uh, in this case, it was train safety, um, uh, was created across a cross-platform IP. If, I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, there was a very catchy little video that was made, um, as well as a series of very simple mobile games, where it was a very casual um, experience of trying to find different ways to avoid catastrophe, right? Don't jump in a pool of piranhas. Don't, get, don't burgle a bear. Don't stick a fork in a toaster. But the message at the very end of the video and of the game was don't cross the yellow line when you're on a train track. Be careful of the trains coming in front of you. Don't be stupid. And it became viral and it, and it continues to send its message uh, throughout culture as this game and this video is, has become uh, intellectual property and continues to grow. Another way to think about uh, games or perhaps other kind of digital medium is what kind of social movement can it help develop? So this example, Macon Money, that I give you is actually not a digital game. It's a physical game that was played in Macon, Georgia, funded by the Knights Foundation. And its focus is that its, its uh, intent was to bring two communities together that were disconnected, an African-American community and a white community in Macon, Georgia, and bring them together, help people meet each other, and actually go and do an activity together. And, this, and, and in this construct, it was about um, finding another person who actually had the other half of a, of a piece of currency. They created a bond that they split in half and gave to different communities. And through meeting people, talking to people, you had to track down the other half of your bond. And if you were able to find that currency and your partner, you were able then to trade that in at the local bank for money and use it in a, a local store. So it not only helped create um, uh, relationship building between these dis disconnected communities that also help drive economic development. The next one to uh, uh, talk about is citizen science. And I know there was a session, uh, I think, on Thursday about citizen science virtual reality projects, but we, there has been a lot of activity in the gaming industry around this as well. So there's a great example that was, uh, that was uh, developed about five, seven years ago, five years ago, called Fold It. It was made out of um, a game experience made out of University of Washington, and it was intended to see what kind of um, a collaborative contribution game players might be able to have to solve a problem that they have not been able to solve within uh, a research community, which had to do with folding proteins in, in uh, an effort to, 
discover a new enzyme to help with uh, the AIDS virus. And it was a problem that took 10 years for, um, uh, for 10 years for a supercomputer to solve. And within 10 days, over 10, 000, around over 7,000 game players were able to collaboratively work on this problem and solve, and solve how to fold this protein. And the work was so significant that it appeared in Nature Journals, and all of the players who played were, were listed as, as researchers on this project. The next, um, the next example that I want to give is behavior change, which is, is really kind of like the, the ultimate goal in um, an impact of can you actually change someone's behavior so they act differently, they, they think not only think differently, but will behave differently in the world around them. And this example, Remission, is a game that was created to change the behavior of young pa cancer patients for them to adhere to the medicinal treatment after they leave the hospital. Will they take their medicine on a daily basis or throughout the day they're supposed to? So this game gave kids the agency to go into their body and fight the cancer in a first-person shooter game, right? So they're literally shooting the red cells. They're going throughout their body. Um, they're winning the fight of cancer in, in this game. And they're transferring that behavior into um, the actual behavior of listening to the doctors, taking their medicine, and, and, uh, and get going into the path for wellness. Um, and this, this game has been going through clinical trials for the past four years, and it's been remarkable, the, um, the effect. The last thing I'm going to talk about is cognitive training and cognitive science. Um, the world of neuroscience and games and virtual reality are, are converging, and there are people out um, in, uh, in the world at universities doing research about how games and virtual reality can actually change the way our, our brains are thinking. And there's this wonderful uh, neuroscientist out at UCSF named Adam, Dr. Adam Ghazali, who has made games that are treating um, Alzheimer's, people with uh, dementia, but also young uh, patients with ADHD, young students. And through cl clinical trials, he's gotten to the point where he's uh, submitted these games, uh, one called ECO, about ADHD, to the FDA, the, drug, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. And should it get passed, and it looks like it will, it will be the first game that can be uh, prescribed by a physician to help treat ADHD. And it'll be interesting to see as more research is going into the virtual reality space and how virtual reality is changing the way our brains function, what, what that can, um, can deliver. So I'm going to end here. Um, but I'll be, I really challenge you to think about how you can use the gaming, some of these gaming principles on impact into your work with VR, and I'll be around for questions afterwards. Thank you.